Добрий день, вітаю вчителів, учнів та батьків на Leadership Speaker Series. Мене звати Олександра Голик. My name is Alexandra Holick and I am the show host of Contact Next Gen and I will be the moderator for today's session. Серію цих зустрічей ми організували для українських старшокласників для того, щоб надати вам можливість спілкування з лідерами нашої громади, надихнути вас їхніми розповіді розповідами і зрозуміти їхні думання та бачення та мати змогу побачити світ очима інших людей. Joining us today is Professor Lyubomir Luzuk, a Canadian academic and author of books and articles in the field of political geography and Ukrainian history. He is currently a professor of political geography in the Department of Political Science and Economics at the Royal Military College of Canada. Today, Professor Luzuk will be discussing his latest book titled Operation Payback. After our discussion with Mr. Lutsuk, students, please feel free to ask questions in the chat, or you can use the raise hand function and ask your questions verbally. Just a reminder that this meeting is being recorded. So, Pana Lutsuk, if you want to take it away, go ahead. Thank you. Um, first of all, can I just ask whether the PowerPoint uh, slides are available now? Good morning, and thank you for joining us uh, today. I, I will be talking about the subject of this book called Operation Payback. But in fact, I think there are broader themes that I also want to address. So I'm going to take this opportunity to, to give you a kind of a perspective that I hope you can take away from today. Not worrying so much about the details of this book or the contents or the debate that it discusses, as thinking about how you as young Canadians of Ukrainian heritage should behave and how you should understand the world you'll be going, growing up in. So as was pointed out by Alexandra, I am a professor of political geography here at the Royal Military College of Canada in Kingston, Ontario. It's where I was born. My parents came to Canada as refugees after the Second World War. So some of you perhaps are the sons and daughters of refugees. Many of you are probably the grandchildren of people who came after the Second World War, or even the great-grandchildren. So you are uh, of a different generation by far than mine. And the kinds of issues that you're going to be dealing with in your lives are very different from the ones that I faced. But that said, there are a few things I think an old guy like me can tell you that might still be useful. First of all, take a look behind me. If you take a notice, you'll notice I have lots of bookshelves, and that's just the beginning of a library that I have in my house that goes uh, you know, quite a distance that way and curves around the wall. I have literally a few thousand books behind me. Why do I mention that? I mention that because as I teach at the Royal Military College, I see just how dependent many students are on the internet, on social media, on doing their research using Google, Wikipedia, online encyclopedias, all those kinds of sources. And that's a big mistake. If you are going to be looking up a date, when did Columbus sail the ocean blue, 1492? That's handy, you know, Google it. But if you're going to be looking at any kind of topic that's controversial, any kind of topic where there are going to be different views and opinions, whether those views are expressed by serious scholars, serious writers, or by crazies, you really need to go beyond social media. I'm just going to call it the internet. You need to go beyond the internet. When you pick a book off the shelf and you look at it and it says University of Toronto Press or University of Alberta Press or Harvard University Press or anything like that, you can be sure of one thing that it has gone through a very careful vetting process. In other words, an author, a scholar, a professor wrote a manuscript. He submits it for publication. It's reviewed by a number of different scholars. They critique it. They comment on it. They recommend it be published or not. And then that professor, she or he, has to revise it, redo it before it's accepted for publication and comes out as a book. It's a very long process. Uh, I've got one book coming out next year in the spring that took almost 10 years to get from conception to print. So it's frustrating. It, it is annoying. It sometimes drives you crazy. But the fact is, when you as a student go to a library, and please use your libraries, when you go to a library and you pull a book off the shelf, if it's published by a serious publisher, an academic press, 
a university press, by some research institute, you can be certain that it has been carefully reviewed. Another thing that happens when you go to a library, if I say want to know about the whole of the more, so I go behind me. In fact, the whole of the more section is just pretty much right behind where I'm sitting. If I pull one book out about the whole of the more on a library shelf, other books about the whole of the more will be grouped near it. That's how librarians arrange books on the shelves. All the books on one theme or in one general area or in one general place. So when you Google something, you will get a list of possible sources and you can find things. But if you actually go to a library shelf and you look, you'll find things that you won't find on the internet. Believe it or not, the internet is not about everything. And in fact, a large number of things that have been published can't be found on the internet. They're either behind a paywall or you have to know where to look. And if you don't look carefully, you'll miss it. So first thing, students, use your library. Sure, use Google, use the internet as a source, but then go further. You'll do much better as students if you take my word for it. Go into the books on the shelves and look around because you'll find things that you won't find anywhere else. Now, I talk about this at the start because what is this book about? This book is about Soviet disinformation. The Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. It disappeared in 1991. Most of you were not even alive then. Why should you care? It's history. Okay, some of you might say, well, I'm interested in history. I, you know, I, I heard about the Soviet Union from my grandparents or my parents, or I saw a movie or something. Okay, you should be interested in this kind of topic because it's not so much the Soviets who no longer exist as the people who took over after the Soviet Union collapsed. So today, you're all very much aware of the fact that there's a war going on against Ukraine, that it was started by the Russian Federation, that it was unprovoked, that it's unjust, that it's in fact has a genocidal dimension to it, that the Russian Federation under the KGB man in the Kremlin, Vladimir Putin, is literally trying to erase Ukraine from the maps of the world and is trying to undermine the very existence of you as Ukrainians. Now, you can say, well, I'm a Canadian-Ukrainian or Ukrainian-Canadian, whoever you want to phrase that, and I'm fine. I'm sitting here in Toronto, or I'm sitting here in Edmonton, or I'm sitting here in Kingston. But the fact is, there are people out there who say you don't exist, who say you've never existed. And even if you might have sort of existed once upon a time, somebody else created you out of nothing. It was Lenin or Stalin or Hitler or the Germans in World War I or, or the American CIA in, in 1991. Somebody else created Ukraine and Ukrainians and you don't really exist and you shouldn't exist. You're just little Russians and you don't know better. So now I'm going to wipe you out. So this is a threat to you. And the way in which the Soviet Union, but more so now the Russian Federation, promotes that idea is by telling lies. So if you show the next slide, one of the great liars of the last century was this man um, by the name of Walter Durante. If you can jump to the next slide, please. Uh, Walter Durante was a, a reporter for the New York Times. So he was one of the um, most important journalists of his time. He was a writer who wrote very well, I, I have to say. Uh, people sometimes say, well, he was a terrible fellow. Yes, he was, but he was a good writer. And he published a number of books. Sorry, can whoever's doing the slides, can you go to number two, please? Pani Tatiana, if you can go to the next slide. So Walter Durante was this New York Times reporter, journalist stationed in Moscow. If you go on Netflix now, many of you go on Netflix, you could take a look and see the uh, film Mr. Jones. You'll see this guy, Walter Durante, there. Walter Durante knew the truth about the whole of the Moors, as we now call the Great Famine of 1932-33, and he lied about it. So he spread Soviet disinformation. Walter Durante knew the truth. So if you look at this slide, you'll see that it has a quotation from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who is one of the great Russian writers of the last 
century. He's now dead. It's not clear whether he really said this, but I think it's a kind of a funny quotation. What did Solzhenitsyn write about the Soviets in his day? We know they are lying. They know they are lying. They know we know they are lying. We know they know we know they are lying, but they are still lying. And this is exactly what Walter Durante did. That's a picture of him in the bottom right corner. Walter Durante knew about the famine and he lied about it. And he spread those lies in one of the most important newspapers of the world at the time, and still an important newspaper, the New York Times. So you as students have to be very critical of what you read and especially what you find on the internet, because there are liars out there right now trying to convince you that Ukraine never really existed, Ukraine doesn't exist, it shouldn't exist, and so on. So if we show the next slide, uh, you'll see a slide that shows a series of little booklets and articles that were published in my time, many years before you were around, by the Soviets. And these were all little booklets that were distributed in the tens of thousands of copies around North America with titles like We Accuse or the SS Werewolves, you know, the SS, the Nazis. This was about the Divisi Halachana, Lest We Forget, Fake Patriots, Truth and Myths About Upa. These were all booklets and little leaflets that were distributed widely and were intended by the Soviets to create the impression that the Ukrainian nationalist movement was dominated by Nazi collaborators, war criminals, fascists, and so on. The target, next slide please, of these people, of these Soviet propagandists, were these people. Some of these could very well be your grandparents or your great-grandparents. This is an image of a protest in Munich, Germany in 1949 in April. If you look at some of the banners and so on, you don't read German probably, but you can see bloodthirsty Moscow, victims of communism and so on. These were the so-called displaced persons, the DPs. These were Ukrainian refugees, victims of the war, people who were slave laborers in Germany during the war, who found themselves in Western Europe at the end of the war, did not want to return to the Soviet Union, were anti-communist, were anti-Soviet, had survived the whole of the war, had survived the Nazi occupation, had fought against the Nazis, had fought against the communists, and now were in the West and wanted to be witnesses to the truth of what had really happened in the Soviet period. These people were very inconvenient for the Soviets and for the Russians today because they knew the truth of what had happened in Ukraine during the Second World War under both Nazi and Soviet occupation, and they were going to tell the world. I like this particular photograph. It became the cover of one of my books, because if you look right down in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, about third man from the left, you'll see a man with big mustache, and beside him there's another man who has his hand out. It looks like he has like a little flower or something on his lapel. That turned out to be my father. He had no idea that his photograph was being taken that day. And there he is, popped back into history. So what happened in North America, you saw all those leaflets that I just showed you in booklets, starting in the 1970s. And again, long before you were born, so you could say, well, why does this matter? And I'll tell you why it matters a little bit later. The Soviets began saying that there were thousands of these displaced persons, these Ukrainian nationals, hiding in North America who had been Nazi war criminals or collaborated with the Nazis, worked with the Nazis in the Holocaust. You, as students, doesn't matter what province you're in in Canada, what level you're at, have all heard about the Holocaust, have been taught about the Holocaust. And yet I suspect that most of you don't know that millions of Ukrainians died during the Holocaust that millions of Ukrainians were slaves in Nazi Germany during the Second World War, and that at the end of the Second World War, large numbers of these Ukrainian refugees were forced to go back to the Soviet Union under the terms of something called the Yalta Agreement, 
which meant that if you'd been a Soviet citizen, you had to go back, like it or not. So the West, America, Canada, France, the United Kingdom, basically forced Ukrainian survivors of things like the Holodomor to go back to the people who caused the Holodomor. It's a, it's a war crime in and of itself. But the issue here is the Soviets were doing their best to undermine the truth that these people were saying. So they issued all these leaflets and booklets and films, and it was a massive propaganda campaign. And by 1984, the government of Canada came to believe, as did the government of the United States, that in fact, there were thousands of Nazi war criminals somewhere hiding in Canada and the United States in the Ukrainian and the Estonian, Latvian and Lithuanian communities. So they created in Canada something called the Duchenne Commission. Some of you may have heard of it. You will probably hear about it later in life. The Duchenne Commission is named after Mr. Justice Jules Duchenne, a French-Canadian judge who was the head of this commission. And starting in 1984 and working for about a year, two and a half years, Mr. Duchenne was given the mandate to investigate whether or not there were thousands of Nazi war criminals hiding in Canada. The target were these displaced persons, people like my parents. I was just a young man. Then. This was 1984. I had just finished my PhD. I'd come back from the University of Alberta to take up a postdoctoral position at the University of Toronto when I was brought into the work of something called the Civil Liberties Commission. Next slide, please. Headed by Mr. John Gregorovich, who you'll see in the next slide. John Gregorovich was a lawyer himself in Toronto. He was a somewhat eccentric man, but a very nice man. He led the Civil Liberties Commission for several years. Tanya, if you could jump to the next slide, please. Um, John Gregorovich is now dead, of course, but he became the first chairman of the Civil Liberties Commission. And our mandate was to answer these allegations about alleged Nazi war criminals in Canada. I have to tell you quite honestly, students, this was a very controversial and very, very unpleasant period of time in my life. There was a great controversy. The Jewish community in Canada was saying, oh my God, there's Nazis next door. Some of our neighbors may be Nazis hiding among the Ukrainian and Estonian and Latvian, Lithuanian, Slovenian communities. We've got to get rid of these people. The same thing was happening in the United States. The media, which tends to be, frankly, usually pretty stupid, um, rolled with these stories and kept reproducing them, kept saying them. We kept saying, well, where's the evidence? They began saying, well, we'll go to the Soviet Union and get the evidence. And we said, really, you're going to go to the Soviets and ask them who we are? You're, you're going to believe them, the Soviets, who perpetrated war crimes over us, the witnesses to Soviet war crimes? It was controversial. We developed a number of techniques to address this. One of them, if you'll see the next slide, please, um, were postcards. You may not know it, but if you want to write to your member of parliament or to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, it doesn't matter what you're interested in. Let's just say you want to have um, better health care or you want to have uh, cleaner water or you're concerned about climate change, whatever it may be. You can write on a postcard or on a piece of paper your message to the prime minister or any member of parliament or any member of the Senate. And as long as on the envelope, you put OHMS up in the upper right-hand corner, no postage required. So it's free. So I know everybody's used to Instagram, and Twitter, and emails, Facebook, and all that stuff. But you know what? If you send me an email, I'll read it. I'll think about it. I'll answer and I'll delete it. It doesn't exist after that. It disappears. If you write someone a letter, they'll keep it. They may put it in a file. They may hold on to it. They may respond. So again, I know it's really easy to just message someone or text someone, right? It's very easy. And that, you know, for daily life, it's fine. But if you're trying to be serious about something, send a letter, especially now. 
So these were the this was the very first postcard that we des- that I designed actually obviously very primitive, um, but we sent thousands of these to the prime minister and began pushing back against the Soviet claim that there were thousands of Nazis hiding in Canada or that this government of Canada should use Soviet evidence. We also did other things in our time. We took out newspaper ads. Next slide, please. So this slide that you'll see now is a slide showing a full page in the Globe and Mail. The Globe and Mail is Canada's newspaper of record. That simply means that if you're a politician or you're someone interested in the news in Canada and what's going on in the politics of our country, you go to the Globe and Mail for your information. So again, I'm sure most of you don't read a daily newspaper in paper copy. I do. Uh, I still like it. Uh, but read the papers, read serious newspapers. Don't get your information from your chat room or from your friends who tell you, hey, look at this, look at that. Yeah, that's fun. But if you're going to keep yourself informed about what's going on in our country or anywhere else for that matter, read the serious newspapers. And again, you have to be judicious. You have to think. You can't just accept everything as true, but you want to consult credible sources. We also in the Civil Liberties Commission to combat this issue of, you know, Nazi war criminals in Canada, put out our own booklets. We took a we took a page from the Soviets and said, okay, you want to put out we accuse SS werewolves and all that stuff. We'll do the same thing. Next slide, please. Here are some of the booklets that we published. So again, on the record, trial and error, not worthy. Soviet evidence in North American courts. These are all booklets that we published and put in libraries around the country and indeed around the world. Now, for those of you in high school and you're perhaps asked to write a write something about the Holocaust, you know, it, it's, um, I mentioned earlier, we're all taught about the Holocaust as we should be in, in school. We learn about the 6 million Jews who perished. We generally forget about all of the others Perhaps they mentioned the Roma, or the disabled, Jehovah's Witnesses, and so on. But very few people in school, at least when I was there, ever talked about the millions of Ukrainians who died, or the millions of Poles, or even, frankly, the millions of Russians. Okay, If you look at that slide, the one in the middle there, the biggest one, into Auschwitz for Ukraine, this was the memoir of Stefan Petelitsky. I met him. I had the privilege of meeting him. Look at his arm. 154922. That's his Auschwitz tattoo. He was a Banderivich. He was a member of Oum and of Upa. And he was also a victim of the Nazis, a survivor not only of Auschwitz, but of Ebensee and several of the other major concentration camps. If you're going to use a source to talk about the Holocaust, to give a class presentation or to do an essay, use this book. It's one of our guys talking about his experiences, and it's in libraries. It's also free on the website of the Ukrainian-Canadian Civil Liberties Association, so you can get it and download it, read it, save it, whatever you like, for free. Share it with your teacher and other students. This is a kind of source that you need to use, and there are others. Eventually, of course, the whole story of there being thousands of Nazis hiding in Canada and the United States was investigated, as I said, by Mr. Justice Jules Deschamps. The next slide shows his final report. So if you see, it says 30th of December, 1986. Actually, it was April of 1987. It was delayed, but theoretically, it was supposed to have been done by the end of 1986. Uh, When you look at this book, it's a very thick book. It's several hundred pages. If you jump to the next slide, you'll see a picture of Justice Deschen, as I remember him. Um, And on his right, I'll talk about those people in a moment. Justice Deschen studied this issue. And this is very important that you hear this. The question was, are there Nazis hiding in Canada? And his answer was no. He said it was grossly exaggerated. Those were his exact words, grossly exaggerated. He said that he looked into the history of the Ukrainian divisia, the Galicia division, the SS division that everybody talks about. He said they cannot be indicted as a group. There's no evidence that they committed war crimes. 
This has been investigated before. It was investigated in 1945. It was investigated in 1950. And here we are again, and I come to the same conclusions. There is no evidence that there were thousands of Nazis hiding in Canada, period. End of story. Who were members of the division? The people on the right, those men in the ranks there. That is the Ukrainian Divizia Halachana, Galicia Division at Rimini in Italy when they were prisoners of war. They were kept in various POW camps for almost five years before they were resettled to England and then screened again and screened again before they came to Canada. The man who was probably most responsible for saving them is the fellow with the pipe. That's Bogdan Panchuk. He became a teacher in Montreal later in life. It's his wife beside him and Chernyowski. Uh, the, the two of them visiting Rimini. Bogdan Panchuk and other Ukrainian Canadian soldiers and servicemen and women who had volunteered to fight overseas for Canada, for democracy, against the Nazis, were the advocates who saved the Divisia and saved people like my parents, the political refugees or DPs. So Justice Deschamps listened to these people and said, hey, you know what? Canadian soldiers, men and women who are serving in our army, fighting the Nazis, aren't going to be saving Nazis. This makes no sense. So again, see how important it is that we published our books in English and made them available. Um, the results of the Deschamps Commission are in my book, Operation Payback. Payback. Some of the screening documents are in this book. I'm not going to pitch my book here. It's less important than the fact that you know that the sources are available to you. If you ever have to address this issue of were there Nazis in North America or in Canada, just go to Operation Payback. Everything you need will be in that book. Okay. Now, this didn't end the matter. You'd think that when Deschamps came out with his report in 1987, Kinesh, unfortunately, no. In the United States, the American government took a different perspective than the Canadian government. The American government said, if you're here and you were a member of Oun or Upa or the Divisia, you shouldn't be here because we asked everyone coming to America what they'd done in the war. We asked everyone absolutely 100%. And if you'd said I was in the Divisia or in Oun, we wouldn't have let you in. Well, first of all, this is a fiction because... I've worked with the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada, and I can tell you procedures are never perfect. They're never exactly identical every case, case by case. It just doesn't work that way. Um, but the American position was, if you were here and we think you may have lied about who you were when you got your American citizenship, we can take your citizenship away, denaturalize you, and deport you. Canada took the position we have to have evidence that you did something wrong before we denaturalize and deport you. In Canada, when the Duchenne Commission concluded its work, that was our government's position, made in Canada. If there's evidence that you did something wrong, you should go to court, and if you're found guilty, then we can denaturalize and deport you. In other words, we upheld the fundamental principle of law. You're innocent until proven guilty. In the United States, they said, Prove you're innocent because we think you may be guilty. Very different. In Canada, not a single person was ever convicted of having been a Nazi or of having done something bad under the Nazi regime. So the government, having failed time and time again to make a case stick, moved to the American position. And we had several years, very unpleasant years. If you look at the next slide, when the government of Canada began accepting the D and D position, denaturalize and deport. Some of you may have heard of this man, Vasil Lubinsky. He was living in Toronto at the time when the government came after him and said, you didn't tell us who you were, what you did during World War II, to which he said, nobody asked me, which is probably the truth. Well, we think you may have done something wrong. He said, I did nothing wrong. I was forced to serve in the uh, police with the Germans were in a, in a uh, capacity as a guard as a, by the Germans. I had no choice. They would have killed my family, but I did nothing wrong. All I did was stand there. And when events at that camp went south, went bad, I wasn't even there. I was back home on sick leave. So I had nothing to do with any kind of war crime or crime against humanity. And I knew Mr. Odinsky. I believe he was telling the truth. 
Um, the government was never able to prove anything, and yet they kept pushing that he should be denaturalized and deported. He never was. Um, again, thankfully, in Canada, our government tried, which I think was a compromise. But when they realized this was going nowhere, they pretty much gave up. Now, of course, some people were very upset about this. If I were Jewish, I would be upset. I would think, God, were there any Nazis here in Canada? Maybe they got away with it. Maybe they were able to escape and hide, tell lies about who they were, and so escape punishment. I hope none, that never happened. I, I sincerely hope. My mother was a slave laborer in Germany in World War II, so I have no mandate to protect Nazis. But the, pop, the issue here is you have to have the proof. You have to have the evidence. You're innocent until proven guilty. I don't care if you steal a chocolate bar from the corner store. You're innocent until they prove you did it. Look, here's the video. Here's here's the little Yuba Mayor stealing a, an O. Henry. Take him to, you know, punish him. If you don't have the evidence, there's no case. So time passed. This whole issue now is moot. In other words, it's disappeared. Because do the math. They're all bright kids. If you were 18-year-old in 1933 when the Nazis came to power, you're 108 now. You're dead. If you were 18 in 1939 when the war broke out and you joined the SS, you're 100 now. Probably dead, or soon will be. Right? So there are no Nazis left, folks. When someone says to you, well, there's Nazis in Canada. Really? Where? What seniors home? Because they're dead. There can be no more Nazis in the world because we all die, right? And very few people make it to 100. I have to say my father made it to 101. So, you know, okay, there's the exception. But the reality is very few of us make it to that age. Now, it's also true that there was one German camp guard just found a few months ago who's 100. He's totally senile, apparently, but the German government has decided to bring charges against him. Fine. If he's guilty, punish him. That's never been the issue. The issue is you have to prove it. Now, as we debated this issue, we also came to the realization that, wait a minute, why is the justice system only looking at Nazi war criminals? What about Soviet or communist war criminals or people who worked with the Soviets and enabled them to do all the horrible things they did like the whole Demore? Well, again, let's do the math. If you were an 18-year-old Ivan and you joined the uh, Ogpu or the, the forerunner of the NKVD, KGB, right? And you were a Soviet secret policeman and you were helping with the whole Demore, you're also long dead. There are, are no none of them left. But maybe if you were a young Russian, 18 years old in 1944, and you perhaps participated in rounding up the Crimean Tatars and then fought against the Baltic nationalists or the Ukrainian nationalists, Oun and Opa, you could still be in your early 90s. So theoretically, some of those men and women could still very well be alive if they survived everything else. Um, the Soviet Union continued until 1991. And so we have to this day individuals who were in the Soviet secret police, the KGB, who are alive and well, including Vladimir Putin. You want to talk about war criminals, talk about his grandfather, who was in Stalin's entourage as a member of the Cheka, whose son, that is Putin's father, was in the NKVD and who himself was in the KGB and is now the president in perpetuity of the Rus so-called Russian Federation. So you have three generations of people there who served Stalin and the Soviet state. And we know what Putin has said about Ukraine not existing and Ukrainians being a, a bunch of fascists and Nazis and so on. This is still a man with a very Soviet mentality. He's my age. He thinks like a Soviet. I think like an anti-Soviet. I get it. I, I don't dispute that he's intelligent. I don't dispute the fact that he has a worldview that's very different from mine. You have to understand it in that context. But the point is, whereas there are no Nazis left, they're all dead because time moves on and every man and every woman dies. 
there are still some Soviets and Russians who served the Soviet regime and Ukrainians who served the, uh, the Soviet regime who are still alive. And there are people in this world who still promote this notion that we should be going after Nazis, but don't like to talk about the fact that there were some very few Soviet criminals in Canada and communist collaborators. If you look at the next slide, we organized a campaign where we said to the government, even at the start of the Shen Commission, why don't you make the mandate broad? Why don't you look for any war criminals found in Canada? And any war criminal found in Canada should be brought to justice. This was our position. What we discovered through the years was that there were several, and I'm not gonna say several dozen, I'm not gonna say several hundred or several thousand, because there weren't, but there were several, I don't know, four, 12, 11, don't know. We found four or five people in Canada who wrote books, who gave interviews, who spoke openly, publicly, and in English, and described how they were agents of the Soviet secret police, had served in the Yudenrat, the Jewish ghetto police, had been Soviet partisans, had killed Ukrainian nationalists, and bragged and boasted about it, and even said, when I came to Canada, I didn't admit any of that. So there's a guy there, you see him in the bottom. Uh, he wrote a book called Resistance and Revenge. And there he is in his NKVD lieutenant's uniform. He lived in Montreal. There's another man above him who wrote his own book. These are books published in English. You can find them on you know, the bookshelves of major libraries. So there were people like this in Canada who had served the Soviet Union, who were communist collaborators, who murdered Ukrainians, and they got away with it. Nobody ever went after them. We even had one man who came in the, um, only a, about a decade ago, who came to Canada, who'd been in the KGB, pretended he was a student, got accepted at UBC was studying for a PhD at UBC, very bright guy, studying Japanese language. I mean, this is no fool. But it was turned out that it was discovered he'd been in the KGB. He was told, you've got to leave. You shouldn't be in this country. He said, well, I'm a refugee. So he had a hearing. He had a proper hearing. He had a lawyer. He lost. People said, no, you're not a refugee. You'll have to leave, sir. So what did he do? He went and hid in a church basement in East Vancouver and said, I'm claiming sanctuary. Well, folks, there's no such thing in law. I know that we all like Walt Disney, and I, all, I know we all like cartoons. And, you know, if the hunchback of Notre Dame takes Ellis Miralda and brings her into Notre Dame and says, you've got sanctuary here, no one will come in and touch you. It's a cute cartoon, but it doesn't exist in reality. There's no such thing. And yet our police, our RCMP, our security agencies would not go into that church to take him out. He spent several years there. So we went after him, and there's the postcard we used. I mean, we, we used that phrase in reference to women, no means no. We turned it into no means no, no KGB in Canada. And eventually he was forced to leave. And last I heard, he was back in Vladivostok. But the government didn't act on it. You will find in your lives that everyone will tell you about Nazi war crimes, even now in 2022, even though there are no Nazis left. It's a historical issue. But when you talk about Soviet crimes against humanity or Soviet war crimes or genocide like the whole of the war, or you talk about what Putin and his Confederates are doing in Ukraine today, that, uh, you know, that's a civil war or that's, you know, you Ukrainians deserved it because of World War II. They'll make up every excuse for ignoring the truth. So we have to honor our own. We have to tell our own stories. And here's one way we did it. Next slide, please. In England, you saw that picture of Bogdan Panchuk and his wife visiting the refugees, the men of the Divizia in Rimini. Panchuk and other Ukrainian Canadian men and women in uniform, you can see some of them in that lower bottom picture, were overseas. They helped defend Britain against fascism. They had a headquarters, their own little London club, as they called it, at 218 Sussex Gardens in Paddington, which is now in a very trendy and upmarket part of London. Um, in those days, it was a, a poor part of town, Notting Hill Gate. You'll, some of you will have heard of it. They rented 
the Mets, the, the home of the priest who ran St. James Paddington. And that's where they began the Ukrainian Canadian Servicemen's Association. That provided fellowship for men and women overseas during the war. When the war ended, most of them went home. But some of them, like Panchuk, his wife, Stanley Froelich, Peter Smilski, and there were many others from all across Canada, stayed behind and for almost five or six years helped save the DPs. And they went and worshipped in St. James. So just two years ago, unfortunately, we got nailed by COVID like everybody else, we commissioned a stained glass window in that church. One day, I suspect all of you will end up in London, England. And when you go there, I want you to go to Notting Hill Gate, and I want you to go to St. James Parish, and I want you to kneel down and say a prayer or pause and think, reflect if you don't pray, and look at that window. We have that window in this historic Anglican church now with a trizu and a sonish the national flower of Ukraine, the national emblem of Ukraine, and the inscription at the bottom, which I know you can't read very easily, but you can see there's poppies there. So we remember the fallen, we remember the sacrifices, but the inscription is also from the Bible. And it basically says, I was a stranger and you gave me shelter. This was the Ukrainians coming to fight for Britain against fascism. They were welcomed by the Brits who needed their help. And then those Canadian Ukrainians People like you and me helped refugees and brought our parents and grandparents here. And now you and I are helping other Ukrainian refugees and displaced persons survive the war, survive the winter, survive the disinformation, and even come and join us in Canada. Wow, folks, complete circle. I never expected this. I could not have predicted this in a million years. There's also a memory war going on. That's how historians call it. It's kind of a fuzzy word, but let's use it. Memory war. Across Canada, there are people who are cowards. They are hooligans. They are criminals. They are blank, blank, fill in the blank, who go around at night because they're cowards, and they spray paint Ukrainian churches. They spray paint Ukrainian monuments in cemeteries at the Mukas across Canada. The next slide, you'll see this. Some of you in Toronto, you know Future Bakery. There it was. Boris Rosnowski put up a sign, stand with Ukraine. And what does someone put? Losers, <laughs> Ukraine, you know, Russia's power, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these are obviously Russians because they can't even spell Ukraine. But, you know, and they're obviously stupid, the illiterates. But you can see these other things. This is a monument to Roman Shukhevich, the leader of UPA in Edmonton at the Sumdmilka actual Nazi. This is the third time the statue was attacked. Below it is a monument to the Divizi Halachina. We've already said that Mr. Deshen said they're not guilty of any war crimes. We've already said that they were investigated in 45 and 1950, Deshen Commission. Even Stalin, and I have the document in the book, told Churchill, I don't care about that division. And yet here is this guy spraining Nazi monument, 14th Waffen SS, on a memorial in a cemetery. These are hooligans, these are criminals. This guy, we not, we're not sure yet because he deserves his day in court, but there's a person who's been identified because he was caught on security cameras spray painting all of this, and he's now been charged. And if he's convicted, good riddance to bad meat. But the point is, there's a memory war. There are no Nazis left, they're all dead. There are some Soviets and Russian war criminals around probably won't be brought to justice because nobody likes to talk about them. So what they're doing now is saying to you, to your generation, your grandparents or great-grandparents were Nazi sympathizers and collaborators, and you've got monuments at the Sum de Milka or at the Plast camp or at your Tzarek somewhere, and we're going to spray paint them, take them down. No one has the right to come onto your private property and do damage. No one has the right to tell you in this free country who you should respect and honor. If you want to honor the veterans of the Divizia, and I think you should, or the veterans of Oun and Upa, you should. It's not up to somebody else to teach you or tell you that they were criminals. But you have to have the information. And this is why people like me work. I have to put information about who these people were in English onto shelves and into your hands so you'll have the ammunition. Now, our enemies are very intelligent. They're very hardworking. Um, I will show you the next slide. We're almost done with my slides. 
Um, this is the actual document called Operation Payback on the left. That's a Soviet era document that comes from October of 1985. And black and white in Ukrainian, but we also have the translation in the book, it describes how the KGB provoked, deliberately provoked tensions between Jews and Ukrainians over this issue of war criminals in North America so that those two communities would hate each other and fight against each other. Those two communities were starting to get together on things like refuseniks and human rights issues in the 60s and 70s. The Soviets were very alarmed about this, recognizing how influential the Jewish community is because of their hard work over decades, how powerful the Ukrainian Canadian community or the Ukrainian diaspora in general could become, how the two getting together would be bad from a Soviet point of view. So they deliberately provoked this controversy. They put fake stories in the Toronto Star. They say so. They shaped American opinion and got the Department of Justice to establish the Office of Special Investigations. And at the bottom, in red, I put it in red so you can see it easy, forced the government of Canada to establish in February of this year, 1985, a commission headed by the lawyer, Mr. Duchenne. So the Soviets did this. We always suspected it, but we couldn't prove it until recently. So Operation Payback actually gives you the document. So someone says there are Nazis in Canada. You can say, honestly, that was never proven. It was talked about. People claimed it, but they couldn't prove it in a court of law. Two, there were some Soviet criminals here, not ever brought to justice, so we'll never know. But we, what we do know for sure is that the Soviets provoked all of this, and here's the black and white document. Okay, next slide. There's the KGB man in the Kremlin. Vladimir Putin in his KGB uniform. There is the president of Ukraine. I'll call him Ukraine's Moses, a president of Jewish heritage. Amazing that Putin would say Ukraine is run by Nazis, including a Jewish president. I mean, this is this is the Soviet mentality at its worst. The consequences of that are war crimes like the massacres that you saw the evidence of at Bucha, and you can see one of the women's hands. The icon above it is actually from the 14th century, but it looks an awful lot like Putin, so I couldn't resist putting it in there. Um, the final slide is that the next one is we are now all very much aware of how Ukraine is literally fighting for its survival. And every single one of you, every single one of you, and I don't care how smart you are, what school you're at, what province you're in, every one of you is an ambassador for Ukraine. Ukraine has never been more in the news than it is now. I have lived almost 70 years, folks, and I am stunned at how much daily, daily reporting there is on Ukraine. When I was your age, I was told there's no such thing as a Ukraine. I was told there's no such thing as a Ukrainian. I had to look really hard to find a single book in English. My Ukrainian is terrible. I mean, I had no school. I had no Ukrainian school. I did not have the opportunities you have. You learn Ukrainian. You know what? That's going to be one of the great advantages of your life. You become bilingual English and French, but you learn Ukrainian on top of that, folks. It will give you advantages that you cannot even begin to imagine yet. Trust me on that, right? You will be rebuilding a Ukraine in Europe. You are the future. But to have a good one, you've got to help Ukraine now survive, and you've got to learn about your past. Thank you. That was a really, really insightful and just informative presentation. Thank you so much. We do have just two minutes left in our session here, but if anyone has any questions, um, please use the raise hand function. Дуже подякувати професору професору Вілоцюку за чудову презентацію, надзвичайно цікаву і потрібну, і побажати всього доброго і ще багато чудової наукової роботи і такої потрібної зараз. Дякую. Дуже дуже дякуємо. Дякую вам. Чи має хтось питання від наших студентів? A final word then next year I mentioned uh, there will be a book coming out called Enemy Archives. It's a book that Professor Vietrovich and I from Kiev put together. 
It's a collection of KGB documents about Oun and Upa translated into English by Marta Olinik. It's a big, thick book, a thousand plus pages. It took us 10 years, as I said, to get out, but it'll be in libraries everywhere. So when someone says to you, Oun were anti Polish or killed Poles in Volin, or Oun and Upa were collaborating with the Nazis, you can go to these, to this book. It, you know, it's not one you're going to buy on your own shelves, but it'll be in the libraries. And you'll be able to say, hey, teach. No, no. Here's what the KGB said about them. And they didn't say that. Right. So you'll have information like we never had before. And I hope you take good advantage of it. You'll need it. Trust me. I know some of you are probably sitting there going, ah, this is never going to happen to me. Ha, I, I'll bet. I'll take bets. Um, you will have a teacher. You will have a university principal or professor not like me, but you'll have their professors. You will have someone at your school. You'll have a fellow student at university, roommate, maybe even a life mate who says to you, there were Nazis in Canada. They were hiding in the Ukraine. You're, you're fine. Your parents are nice. You know, I stand with Ukraine. But boy, that those Ukrainians back in the 40s and 50s were a real bunch of bad people. You've got to be able to answer that. It will have an impact on your careers, on your jobs. And if you think I'm kidding, one last thing. I helped organize a, con uh, a concert at Queen's. It's going to happen next Thursday, raising money from Ukraine. They invited me to help them organize this conference. And then a few weeks after I got very much involved and it's going ahead, I was told I could not participate because some people objected to me being part of it. Why? Because I've stood up for the Ukrainian cause and they don't like that. So I backed off. I said, you know what? I'll still help you. Let the concert go forward because it's for Ukraine. I will not attend. I will not, but I'll still help you. So there are these kinds of people who don't have the courage to look you in the face and call you names. They'll stab you in the back. Be careful. You, you are going to face this, folks. I know it doesn't sound like it. They'll look at your name. They'll ask you who you are, who your parents were, and, and these prejudices are there. So study our literature. Learn it and be prepared with your answers. That's what people like I try to do for you. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Like, Thank you again, Professor Lutuk, for taking the time to speak to all of us today and just provide some incredible insight. So in a few months from now,